Good morning. Um, thanks for everybody's participation here. Uh, my name is Brian Kelly. I'm the editor uh, and chief content officer of U.S. News & World Report. And we've got a great panel uh, that we're going to look at uh, a couple of the issues that have come up in this, this morning, and we're going to try to connect some of the dots. So the issue here is uh, connecting education with corporations, the education sector in, in many forms, uh, not just traditional education necessarily, and figuring out what companies are looking for and how we put those pieces together. And we've got four really great panelists who represent a variety of, of, the, of the issues uh, on, that, on that topic. Um, you, you've got their bios in your, in your pamphlets there, so I'm not going to go into, into great detail. I'm going to start right in with everyone because we are a little pressed for time. Um, and, and ask them to just give a quick intro of, the, of themselves and their companies here um, and then address, some, address the issues. The, the key overarching thing that I think we want to look at in the theme is what's working in this space and how do we scale it? Um, scale becomes the, the real overarching uh, problem I think we see throughout uh, the, the, the skills, jobs, disconnect. And we know lots of things that work in small, in small places. How do we take it to a much larger scale because the problem is that large? So I want to start with, with Ty Ahmed Taylor, who um, is the CEO of THX, uh, very tied into the Silicon Valley world uh, and, and the looking at companies in that sector and what they're looking for. So I want to, I want to ask Ty to start and, and give us a sense. What are companies looking for in terms of skills coming their way? Uh, I th well, in the, in the Valley, obviously, uh, engineers are sort of uh, at, the, at the top of the rank, but the other type of skill sets that are generally uh, uh, of interest are in the product realm, user experience design, business development and partnerships, and marketing. Um, for all of those, I think the, the key thing and the thing that is looked for, generally speaking, in job interviews is the ability to communicate well. We were having a discussion before uh, the panel uh, talking a little bit about the types of education that lead to that. So you certainly can major in computer science, you can major in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, business and finance, but what anybody's really looking for is uh, you know, the ability to communicate with both the verbal and the written word, and that seems to be uh, sort of the, the, the one skill set that's prized over everything else. Yeah, so Roy, you're at Cisco, so also in the Valley, but, but yep. beyond that, I mean, Cisco's touching industries across the board. What, what are we missing, do you think? Well, I think there's, you know, when I look at kind of my role, which is, which is looking at what do we do from early in career, anywhere from early in career, early in what we call grade, right? Coming out of colleges, universities, vet programs, et cetera, all the way to kind of more advanced areas, right? So what do I do after 10 years, right? What are my consulting capabilities? There's really two different focus areas. One is kind of the technical skills that we're, we, we look for is it really is a cross section between technical and, and kind of communication, teamwork, partnering. Because the kind of the work of the future, really, I, what we see is problems are bigger than one person now, right? So your ability to team and the power of teaming, not only within your own team, but across different teams, right? The problems and the slowdown that kills our agility is handoffs between teams. So how do you communicate effectively broadly? How do you look at all of those areas. So that's, that's a big piece. On the technical side, you know, the number one goal for us is you know, making sure that people can actually do the jobs that we have when they get started. So for us, really, in my organization, which is really kind of the global services organization, it, it's really around when I hire somebody in new, it's how long does it take for me to make them productive? So even if I get somebody into the organization with a computer science degree, I still spend four to six months training them on exactly how do you, how does a network work? How am I gonna, you know, how does a technology work? How do you troubleshoot an environment, right? How do you speak to a customer? These sorts of things. So I think it's, it's both of those elements, right? It's that analytical thinking. It's all of the things you heard in the video, but it's also then wh what capabilities do you have when you come in that I can get you to work right away? Linda, you're in the higher ed sector, dean of the business school at, at uh, George Washington right now, and soon to be the president of Baylor. So first, right. congratulations. Thank you. Um, good, congratulations, I think. Thank I know, you. I know no, I'm looking of, forward to it. I know a lot of college presidents. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Um, That's true. But um, in any event, um, talk about the, the, higher, the, the higher ed sector and mm -hmm. how it, it is or is not adapting to the needs of, of these corporations. 
Well, as most people know, higher education has been around for a very long time, and we typically are very slow to adapt and to change. Uh, but I think what's happening in the, the business world and in, in the economy generally is forcing higher education to move more rapidly. I think several things that you're seeing happen. Um, one, I think you're seeing a lot more collaboration across units within higher education. You talked about work's not going to be individual, it's going to be team-based, but also solving problems and, and solving issues isn't going to be disciplinary-based, it's going to be interdisciplinary. So I think we're doing much, much better in higher education at working across units within the institution of higher education to give our students a, a broader understanding of how to integrate across fields and ideas. I think the other thing that we're seeing a lot more of, and this is uh, an area where we need to continue to work, is how we're partnering with businesses and other organizations outside of higher education so that our faculty are staying better informed on what they need to do and how they need to adapt, but also um, how, how we can help both with us having the academic content and business having more of the practical perspective and how we integrate that. And then I think the other thing we're trying to work on is how we help our students to be adaptable. Because I think as we know and as we'll talk about here is what they do now is not what they'll be doing probably one year from now or three years from now because technology is changing so rapidly and the world's changing so rapidly. So how do we help them understand and develop the skills that, yeah, we're teaching you some things now, but you've got to continue to learn and you've got to continue to develop and advance your skills. So kind of a higher, higher level way of thinking about learning. I want to come back to that partnership question for sure. everybody, but I want to get to J John Everfi. Tell us quickly a little bit about what Everfi does, and, sure. and, and you're in the K-12 sector, so we're, we're getting that other perspective here. Yeah, and, and, and as a technology entrepreneur, all this talk of communication is making me uh, <laughs> less embarrassed about my liberal arts uh, degree from Bowdoin College, so uh, it really has helped me become I think a good communicator uh, in many ways, but uh, but at Everfi we are uh, an education technology company, so we deliver um, programs across the country uh, that teach students critical skills. And really, for us, um, a couple of the critical skills that resonate with our discussion today are STEM careers and entrepreneurship. Those are two of our biggest uh, programs that we scale across um, thousands of schools in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and we do it in a unique way. We actually partner with the private sector. Uh, we actually partner with um, Consumer Technology Association. We're proud to call them a partner of ours in Clark County. We, we teach students in high school in Clark County about entrepreneurship. We partner with hundreds of other organizations across the board, professional sports leagues, nonprofits, and other private sector uh, organizations to deliver these, these, uh, these programs around areas like STEM careers and entrepreneurship, which really at the top of the funnel of what we're talking about today is getting kids uh, interested, igniting an, a spark uh, in their interest in these careers to know that they're out there, to know what they have to do to pursue them academically beyond where they are in K-12 into, into higher ed. So uh, it's been a unique experience um, and one I think that uh, you know, we, we recognize uh, you know, the needs in, in so, sort of from a unique um, uh, vantage point. So you, you mentioned STEM, John, and STEM, a lot of this debate, I think, began a number of years ago around just STEM and, and people focusing on the, tech, the technology aspects. I, I was at one conference where a Nobel Prize winner said it should just be M for math, because if you know the math, you can do anything. But what I'm hearing from Ty and, and, and from Roy and, and others in the, in the corporate world is it, it, has, it has to go beyond that now. It's not enough to just have the math skill, have the engineering degree. Um, how, how, did, how do you teach that? And I sort of throw this out to everybody, but how, how do you teach these seeming intangibles that are now becoming so important? I, I could start. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think certainly um, you have to pr use uh, ways that collaborate and facilitate kind of these, these discussions. And I think one of the interesting things that I've observed um, in the classroom across the country is technology can be a real catalyst to this. It's a little bit counterintuitive in the sense that you know, using technology in the classroom, you think you know, you're not communicating with your classmates, but it actually can be a facilitator to spark discussion, to, sp to spark debate. Uh, I think about what we did actually in Las Vegas in January at the end of CES where we had a, a business pitch competition from local students who consumed our technology course on entrepreneurship in the classroom. So they did it on their own, they did it with their teacher, uh, but then it spun itself into an opportunity to think on their feet, be able to argue um, you know, their ideas in front of a group, which I think fosters some of these skills that you know, my fellow, fellow panelists are talking about this morning. Yeah. Ty, you, we talked a little before, but you, you have, you're skeptical about the traditional education system and the ability to teach these sort of things. How do we get, how do we get that education? 
So I, I, I have a nine and 11 year old and I'm trying to develop a curriculum for them where they can think, you know, to prepare them for what I foresee that their future might be. And it's actually really hard. And, and, uh, and I, I don't have a, I, I won't say that I have a perfect model to follow. Part of it is some of the things that we talked about there. Part of it is uh, putting them into engineering classes after school for introductions of programming. There was a big thing this week about what was the first language that you learned because it was an anniversary for basic programming language and, and that's the first language that I learned on. Uh, there are maker classes, maker classes where they learn to do things with their hands, but I think, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a high school basis, all students should be exposed to computer science in some way, shape, or form, in addition to a core curriculum around, you know, English and history and, and things of that sort. And then in college, I would suggest that they continue to take comp sci courses, but they also learn how to, be, be, learn how to communicate with, with fellow students, both through the written word and, and verbally. Mm -hmm. And so balancing a traditional uh, engineering-based curriculum with a liberal arts sort of like a cognitive uh, thought and ability to communicate, communicate curriculum, you know, between 10 to 22. Um, there's no clear roadmap for that, but that's, that's what I'm trying to enact, and I think that that's what's going to prepare students for the future. Linda, who, who teaches this? How, how, I mean, it, it, this is not simple. We, we always come back to the issue of teachers, right? We right. need more teachers that are skilled in this. How, how do we get there? I think it's a combination. I think it's a partnership in terms of how we do the education. And I think one of the really important parts of it, in order to be a good communicator, you have to actually practice communicating. Mm -hmm. You don't learn to communicate by reading a book about communication. And so, uh, so I think one of the things we're doing better in higher education is giving students these really applied experiential opportunities where they're presenting to each other, they're presenting to the business community. Uh, we do tons of mock interviews with students. So we do it in the classroom. Our career services offices do a lot of work with students on how they engage and interact, both in formal settings as well as in informal settings. Um, and I think tied to the technical side of it, one of the things I think we're seeing more and more in some of our technical classes, and we do this in our business analytics degree, is not only teaching them how to do the technical side and the analysis, then how do you take what you found in that analysis and communicate it in a way that the average person that's going to hear it can understand it. So it's, it's also that ability to translate complex ideas and technical findings in a way that the sort of average person in your organization can understand it. So I think it takes a combination of us in academics and then partnering uh, with the business community and outsiders so that they understand it from an academic perspective, but then they also have the experience of doing it in a more applied setting. Mm -hmm. Roy, Cisco has done a lot of teaching for a long time outside the, the, yes. the, the people think of you as, as a certain kind of company, but I know it's been, to talk a little bit about some of the, that, that, the teaching aspect of what Cisco has done. Well, probably one of the biggest things we have is we have the Net Academy, which is really kind of networking certification classes that, you know, in the U.S. alone, we'll have over the last 20 years put, you know, over a million students through. And that's anywhere from community college, uh, university, you know, trade areas, vet programs, which we are hiring more and more through that program. Um, so it's really around, right, how do we create a curriculum and work with kind of both private and, and public institutions, right, to influence, right, their curriculum in a way that it adopts some of that, right? And, and when we talk about scale, I think there's an interesting question here because if you think about it, there's a lot of the disciplines that we teach individually at learning institutions and we, cre we create the wheel many, many times. One of the advantages that we've seen is where you can have kind of one authority kind of own real time what's happening, what needs, what, what, what capabilities do we need, how is it changing, right? What's the best way to teach it? And what's the best way to kind of identify whether the students are actually getting it? We can scale that in mass, right, and deliver that globally, not only that, globally, but particularly in the US in a way that, that unburdens, right, an instructor from having to know that, and they can spend their teaching time really focus more and more on how do I hit individual students? How do I adjust it for them? I don't have to have a psychometric understanding of what's the best way to assess whether they actually got the material. I can deliver that, right? So this idea, you know, I think about things like physics. I think about many of these things, right? My experience when I went to university and I went to multiple, I kind of have a challenge, right, in my early career, was that every time I went, it was kind of like we taught it a different way. Right? We wanted to put our own stamp on it. So I think from a scalability, there's some of these things, and maybe you see that in your area, yeah. where if, if you can understand the science around how do you get people to learn this particular capability, then you can spread it out in a very scalable way and of a lower cost to the institution. So that's kind of one of the areas that um, 
I think that we've seen a, a lot of success and we've, and we've done that for a long time. Yeah. What, what's the business case for that, for Cisco? And, and Ty, more broadly, is there a business case that other companies should be getting into this? Well, I, I'll, I'll just say real quick, I'm sorry, Ty, but I would just say for us, right, it is about this idea of, right, I think originally, right, the idea was that, you know, we understood that there was going to be the next industrial revolution 20 years ago, and we needed this kind of skill set in the workforce, right? I think as we look at it more and more, right, we're seeing more of those people, I'm hiring a lot more of those Net Academy people for Cisco, right, internally, and that have been through the program, but for me it's around time to productivity, time to satisfaction in the job, because when you look at kind of particularly the millennials, right, and the next generation, the number one thing that I hear is they want to be productive, they want to contribute day one. So, right, the longer it takes you to contribute, the more frustrating it becomes. So, so that's kind of, I think, the business case for us is it, it really is around, right, shaping the industry, right, and providing that because we all benefit. All of us tech companies benefit as the skill sets increase, but it's also for us personally, it's a better experience for the folks we hire, but it's also a better experience for us in terms of um, how, how, how quickly we can translate somebody into a productive member of the team. Yeah, Ty, talk to that more broadly, the business issues. Business, uh, I mean, the business case, are there other companies, you know, Cisco, I think, is, you know, we, we actually, exemplary, but there's other companies doing this. And sure, so we actually train about 1,000 people a year in how to install high-end uh, home uh, AV systems, which is, the core of what we did is that we were founded by George Lucas in 1983 through release of Return of the Jedi, because he wasn't happy with the way that the Empire Strikes Back had looked and sounded in movie theaters. And so we have our own set of training programs for people who are doing home theater installations, uh, media rooms, uh, uh, specifically on this front, um, that is uh, basically to, to bring their skill sets up to speed. It, they also serve as ambassadors for the brand, so the business imperative is that they now are THX certified when they're doing their work, but more, and they act as evangelists for why you would want higher end material and why you want a quality experience in the home. So the business imperative is that all of that training actually goes to, to, to building a, a sales force that's second to none because they're talking about your products yeah. when you're not in the room. Yeah. To share, share, you're going to share with us though the story we were talking about before about your, your newest employee, which I think oh, is sure. So, uh, uh, Because we do provide this sort of like superior audiovisual experience, we, we often have uh, uh, some challenges finding uh, technical talent uh, because people tend to go directly into computer science as opposed to into the audiovisual realm. So we hired a, a young man uh, who's still in university, so he's 22, and uh, when he, he's still in school, he's, he's gonna graduate at the end of the month, and then he's gonna start with us. But over spring break, he came and worked with us for a week. And so we had to hire him as a contractor, so we weren't viol violating any employment laws. And uh, uh, our competitors in the space uh, were trying to pursue him, so I wanted to make sure that I locked him in. So I met with him during his spring break week when he was in the office and had a sit down with him, and it dawned on me as I was entering the room that he was the first person that I was speaking to who was in Gen Z. So I have millennials on staff, I have baby boomers on staff, and I have, I have Gen X, which is my generation, in, on staff. But the cutoff for millennials is about 23, 24, so he was Gen Z, which is the same age category as my kids. And so when, when we were having the conversation, his, you know, he was like, so, I'd, I'm very interested in knowing your strategy for the next five years and what role I play in it. And I said, I, you know, and, and so that was, a new, that was a new question for me and I had to think very quickly on the fly, so I appreciate him challenging me. So I laid out the strategy and I laid out, you know, for any company, there are more, there's more work to do than there are people are to do it, and so he'd be playing quite a critical role. And he seems satisfied with that, so I hope that we can retain him. <laughs> <laughs> we can all look forward to uh, the next uh, surge of talent here. Um, John, you, you also are in the scale business, and, yes. and how, to, how have you succeeded at that, and where do you think you can take it going forward? Sure, I think you know, for us, uh, obviously using a technology as a learning platform in the classroom allows us to scale our work uh, across thousands of schools. And a couple of the things that we've seen as a result of that and, and where we can, I think, further take it um, is well, building off of one of the points Roy made, you know, one of the things that our technology uh, our learning platform enables a teacher to do in the classroom is to allow them to focus on the core subject. Because one of the things that we uh, you know, struggle with in this, sort of the chicken or the egg in our world is you know, we want to get kids excited about STEM careers, but at the end of the day, they need to be fundamentally proficient in math and science. Our content and our, our, our learning platform can take the burden of teaching entrepreneurship, for example, away from a teacher who maybe doesn't really understand that. 
and allows them to focus on what they're trained to do, which is to teach um, the core subject. So I think that the scale and the ability to get, use our technology to reach a population level uh, of students at a certain um, level of, of, um, of, of K-12 has, uh, has been a real benefit to those teachers. The other thing that it's really done, I think, um, that we think a lot about and I think we're really proud of is we've, it's enabled us to get to a diverse set of communities across the country. Um, you know, and in, in many ways, a lot of our, our, our tech sector jobs are concentrated in certain urban markets. Um, we're proud of the fact that, you know, we started our business working in some of the poorest communities across the country, in the Mississippi Delta and the farm fields of Iowa um, and everywhere kind of in between. And for those um, communities, it's important, I think, to, uh, to get students to, to build the top of the funnel, not only in those core tech sector uh, urban areas, but also in those communities in between. And the ability to sort of get those individuals um, excited and aware of these careers that are out there, whether it's entrepreneurship or some of these technical careers, I think is important. And so our ability to use technology to do that has enabled us to kind of reach a scale and a diversity of communities um, that I think is going to ultimately benefit the workforce. Because at the end of the day, the biggest thing that we hear from corporations when you think about the, the, your question about the business case is they want to fill the top of the funnel uh, in an increasingly uh, large way. And, and the only way you're going to do that is you have to cast a wider net. You have to go to a, a more diverse set of communities. And uh, we've seen our ability uh, to use our technology to scale to those types of communities as a real uh, benefit to, the, to our partners we work with. But you, you need corporate support to do this, right? Yes. You are getting corporate money to come into the, the public education system. Yeah, it's, it's a really unique model in the sense that we're not a traditional publisher that would go and ask a, a school district to pay a license to use our technology. We actually ask our port, corporate partners to cover that license fee mm -hmm. and in turn allow them to private label the program as theirs. Um, and so they're able to sort of get their brand out in the community. They're able to do it in a way uh, where we're doing the work for them. We have a, a team of, of educators that are former T, you know, T, uh, Teach for America core members and other um, folks who've taught in the classroom who work with um, educators all across North America to implement our program. And we do it on behalf of our corporate partners who are, who are sort of supporting us. So that kind of nexus of public-private sector uh, partnership that we create I think, again, gives us a unique perspective. And how, how do you, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to make a sale for you here, right? So how, <laughs> how, how do you make that connection? How do you sell the company or do they come to you? How, how, how does that how Yeah, does so happen? I think what they look at is, um, we work with all types of organizations and they're, they're looking for uh, unique ways to have kind of a corporate social responsibility footprint in the community. In many ways, uh, you know, companies come to us and they say, we just are struggling to have an impact in schools in our community. Um, we don't know how to get into the classroom. We don't know how to make students aware of opportunities with entrepreneurship, opportunities with technical careers. So a lot of the folks who run CSR, um, communications and other community um, functions at companies will come to us and they'll say, we want to have an impact in our community. We want to give back. But at the same time, we want to have a bit of an ROI because they recognize this skills gap issue. They recognize they need to fill the top of the funnel in a more substantial way. So that's really the big um, selling point for us um, when we go out into the communities. And one of the things that's been great about what we've done is we've got this really diverse set of, of corporate partners. So not only you know, do we have companies that are in the technology field, like some of my colleagues here, but we have professional sports leagues. You know, one of the mo more unique stories that we've uh, experienced over the last three years is the National Hockey League came to us three years ago and they said, we want to rewrite our community program and our community footprint across North America, and we want to focus it around STEM careers. And I was kind of interesting, you know, I really admire Gary Bettman, the commissioner, because he had a, a vision for how he wanted to do this. And uh, we worked together to kind of construct this program where we use the game of hockey to teach students in grades four through six about STEM and STEM careers. So you're using a platform that kids kind of have interest in, for the most part. I know not every, every student's an avid uh, sports fan, but at least it's a unique way. It's different than what they're traditionally getting in the textbook uh, to get them excited, to spark their interest. And we do that for other partners um, and, uh, across, across the board in the corporate sector, and it's been, you know, it's been certainly some very fulfilling work. Ty, are you ready to sign off? <laughs> Thanks very much. Good deal here. <laughs> See you later. One of the, I want to ask you, Ty, because you, 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 know, you talk about your, your new employee and how competitive some of this can be. And one of the things I certainly hear in the Silicon Valley world is um, companies talk the talk that they want to expand the pool and everything else, but what they really want to do is you know, get the best talent for themselves, and, and it becomes a zero-sum game. How, how do, 
do, is that your experience, and or and how do you sort of change that cultural mindset that, that growing the pool is is be, is good for everybody? Well. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Housing costs are the highest in the nation. Uh, commute times are among, amongst the longest. Uh, and uh, that that's not really sustainable. And so I think that we have to grow both the, the pool of folks who are uh, able to do the jobs that we're talking about. We have to get some diversity in terms of location. Uh, and so, you know, I, I would love to see Austin hold its own as a technology hub. Uh, 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 for example, and, and to see the growth of uh, more non-government-based technology in DC, just so that we have some geographical di diversity to even out the cost basis. Um, it's my view that uh, you know you have you have top line revenue and you have operating income, and those are basically how I'm judged in terms of how I run the company. And so ha our biggest cost is talent. And so having uh, this in inexorable creep in terms of talent cost is not good for anybody long term. And there, we deserve to have a diverse workforce with regards to where they're located physically. Uh, and so uh, a, rising tides, a rising tide lifts all boats. Some of the issues that are, that are now paramount for the United States as a whole, things like immigration uh, and uh, technical immigration, H-1B visas and things of that sort, are all driven by uh, a perceived lack of talent. I, I, I would argue that the talent is is, is available, but it's just geographically dispersed. Yeah. And so I think it's important that we're all doing that because it, it, it actually translates into the bottom line in terms of what you can deliver yeah. in terms of both revenues and, and operating income. Interesting. Um, Linda, I want to, in terms of higher ed's role in this and talking again about scale, um, and I, I follow the education space pretty closely sure. and big, big development last week, uh, Purdue University acquired Kaplan, right. the, the online, uh, company that the Washington Post had been running. Um, some people have suggested that's a really, potentially really profound change in, in the landscape. Sure. Talk, talk, what do you think of that, and, and is that a real positive? Does that sort of begin to address some of the issues we're talking about here, about scale, geographic distribution, a lot, a lot of these yeah. issues? Well, it's a really bold move for Purdue to do that, and I think all universities are sort of struggling with how to play in that online space, and what's the right way to do it, and do you partner? or do you build it yourself? And so they've obviously chosen to acquire an already very successful company. The risks with that for a university like Purdue are the reputation questions that come into play. Um, Thunderbird School of Business, before it was sort of transitioned to uh, Arizona State, sort of tried to partner with Laureate and had all kinds of issues and questions about that. But if you can do it in the right way and can partner in the right way so that you uh, manage those reputations, I think it does sort of immediately give you uh, the ability to scale. And frankly, I think part of what Purdue's doing too is they're tapping into a completely different education market than they do. The students that do the Kaplan degrees are not the same students that do Purdue degrees. And so it's a completely different population that they are not able to serve as effectively. So I think that's gonna be important. And the other thing I would say related to this, and, and kind of with the d distribution of where the centers for kind of growth are, you do see universities, particularly those that have a lot of science and engineering and technology that spin out a lot of entrepreneurial ventures, starting to create many Silicon Valley-like uh, locations around them. Purdue would be a, you know, a, a good type of university for that. So the places you've seen that start with Silicon Valley, Boston, we have these really great universities, but I think as those become you know, expensive and sort of uh, concentrated, you start to see some of these sort of second uh, tier size locations where universities are starting to spin out their own companies. And because technology allows you to be a company mm -hmm. without having to be in a big city, uh, you can have a you know a really successful company because of the use of technology. So I think that's going to be another role universities play, is sort of being hubs of innovation and entrepreneurship as students who want to be entrepreneurial spin those kinds of things out. And then partnering with folks like Kaplan sort of gives you a way to scale that maybe differently than you could before. And do you think that the um, what students emerge from uh, a a Kaplan type education, is that adequate? I mean, from your perspective as somebody in a you know, very prestigious brick and mortar school, <laughs> I, I'm gonna ask you that question, then right. I'm gonna ask Roy, would you hire that person? Yeah. Um, is it good enough? Well, I think it depends on what types of jobs they're getting ready to go into and what skill set that you're looking for in that person. Mm -hmm. And I think there are things that a Kaplan would do that would develop a set of individuals for jobs that a 
the traditional programs at Purdue would not do. And so I think you have to recognize that you're probably having programs that prepare students for different types of career paths and different kinds of opportunities, and not necessarily that one's better than the other, but that they're sort of different and, and dipping into different populations and probably different job streams along mm -hmm. the way. Yeah, well, no, I, I, I would agree with that. Look, we, we um, I, I will target multiple avenues where I can get the capabilities I need for the roles I'm trying to fill, right? And I will also help those educational institutions, right, that I need, right? So. The work we're doing with, you know, um, Fort Bragg and Camp Lejeune, right, with veterans, right? A lot of them don't have a traditional background or degree, but I can run them through an accreditation program, give them the capabilities of tools, video, or whatever, and I'm more than happy to do that. But I do think that there is a, you know, there's, there's, there's multiple paths and careers, right? And I think I heard the tail end of the previous um, sp speaker, and I think it's spot on, right? You only need so many CTOs, and for every CTO, I need 10 or 20, you know, network, right, directors that are running that network, and I need so many of these, and so I don't think it's, I think it's an and function, right? And it goes back to this idea, right, I think what we're all saying is, you know, Cisco by itself can't solve the problem, none of our companies by themselves, government by itself. This is something we've all gotta be in on, right? And when we think about, you know, when I think a little bit about kind of this idea of a lifelong learner, I think this, there's this opportunity for our institutions, right? Rather than think about, I got my four-year degree, which is really commencement, mm -hmm. who's my lifelong learning partner? Right. And that's where these kind of things, I think, can be really powerful, that I get some certifications to be able to do a job, whether that's the degree or certification. But now I've got somebody I can lean on, right? That every, every three years, I can go back and I can go to mm -hmm. the same university and get the next certification, the next, what do I need as the environment changes? So thinking about how, how do we become interlocked as lifelong learning partners here, right? And how do we adapt to meet people where we are is, is gonna be really critical. But, um, but to the earlier question, I think there's different paths and I hire from all those, we'll hire from all those avenues. Right, the, I mean, the, yeah, the pre previous speaker was very interesting. Northern Virginia Community College is, is, is very progressive on a lot of that work, we followed that. But um, you know, he, he was stressing the middle skill jobs and the, you know, exactly. every, everything we're talking about here is fairly high level, I think. How do you, um, you know, how do you create, I, I, let me start with John, because I, I think a lot of this starts in K-12. Yep. How do you create a culture? Is, do we need a culture shift that more, you know, a lot of this comes to parents. As he said, those, are, those jobs are all great, but my kid's gonna get a bachelor's degree in English or whatever it is. <laughs> right. and, and, there, and there's this, that I think is one of the fundamental disconnects we're dealing with. H how do you create that culture shift? Well, I think it all starts with awareness. I think that uh, you know, making students aware of the, the careers that are out there and the alternative paths um, that, that, that are available to them um, is, is the most important thing. And I think uh, get, sparking that interest and, 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 and allowing them to start to pursue those, those opportunities is, is something that um, uh, is probably the biggest key. And then in turn, allowing our educators to understand that and that kind of proliferates out uh, into the classroom. At the end of the day, our, our public schools serve the majority of the young, young folks who are coming up um, into, uh, in, into the workforce. And if we can increase that awareness and make them uh, understand that these are the jobs of the future, and that the, some of them are, are very high end, but some of them are, are, are low end. I was, I was listening to a, an interview with um, Senator Klobuchar from uh, Minnesota, and she likes to describe the, the idea of blue STEM jobs, right? So the idea that there's blue collar STEM uh, careers out there, uh, you know, whether they be uh, you know, an electrician, uh, a welder, uh, you can really, you know, uh, I think make a, an adequate and very, very successful and lucrative career um, by, by becoming aware of those opportunities. So what we try to do is in our programming, as a student's going through one of our learning courses, um, the end of our STEM career courses gives them an array of career cards that they can sort of self-select and explore into different areas that give them the array, both the high end, the, the middle end, the blue stem, whatever you wanna uh, call some of those careers, but we try to make them aware of that diversity. So the scale of our program hopefully increases that awareness and hopefully that's a, that's a start. Yeah, so Verizon had a wonderful commercial in, during the, the March Madness, and I don't know if anyone saw it, it was really, oh, yeah. they had kids talking about what do you wanna be when you grow up, I wanna be in the NBA, I wanna be in the NFL, and then they had LeBron James come on and it had, the caption said there's 625 NBA players, <laughs> yep. and LeBron James said we don't need any more NBA players, <laughs> yes. we need more engineers, we need more. Um, and that I thought was very powerful when the corporate sector starts to actually 
advocate yeah. a culture One shift. of the things that's interesting on that, to build on, uh, one of the more progressive uh, hockey clubs we work with is are the New Jersey Devils. Um, they obviously operate in a, in a very impoverished community in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and one of the things they try to do is they're not trying to make their star player the, 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 the guy whose students are sort of attracted to in our program. We actually went around the arena and we interviewed all of the occupations that go into running an arena that are technical, from the audiovisual scoreboard operator to the, uh, to the ice technician to the, the trainer and the nutritionist. And we tried to help the students understand that within just this one example of a, of a hockey arena, there's so many other careers beyond yeah. what that professional athlete's doing, like right. a LeBron or another, right. another pro athlete. Ty, you must be, you're not hiring all superstars, right? I mean, you're hiring, well, I, you, you need middle I, skills. But I have to dip into colleges to find, yeah. to find the people that we're looking for. How do, you, how do you convince them that this is a great career? Uh, well, in, in part, I, I, I by no means mean it, uh, meant to uh, poke fun at the young man that I spoke with. Uh, it really was about describing the scope of the opportunity that was available for him. I spend a lot of time and investment in, in terms of uh, growing the skill sets of my team because what I say is, you know, uh, uh, some C CEOs like to take credit for company success. My, my job is to make everybody in the company successful. And that's really proved to be a, a valuable selling point as we, as we do seek to attract talent. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, we have a, a large patent portfolio so that they can get the fame and glory that comes with you know, having patentable applications as well. Yeah. We're, um, we're in Washington, DC, uh, the center of the universe. I, <laughs> for those of you who aren't from here, it's, it should be readily apparent as you get here. Um, the, the, I know there's a number of members of Congress who spoke this morning and afterwards, so I want to I ask, on the, on the government role here, uh, start with federal, but obviously there's other, what, what and I put this to everybody, is there more the federal government can do to help us scale, connect the dots on the subjects we're talking about? Is it a state issue? Uh, is it local? Is there anything we think we, we can get more from the government to help solve this challenge? Uh, I, I, I think there are two vectors. The first I would say would be uh, universal broadband access, and so uh, part of what the FCC is, is attempting to do is to get broadband uh, deployed more broadly. Um, I would suggest that once that you do have broadband deployments on a more wide basis, even in rural areas, that uh, uh, getting rid of net neutrality laws is not going to be advantageous toward the, towards the creation of new businesses uh, because it, it, it sets sort of different tolls for different lanes on the, on the, on the highway. Um, and so that's something from my perspective, having both worked at Comcast and also having worked for many startups that maintaining the current net neutrality suite uh, would be proactive in terms of uh, allowing for future job growth. Yeah. Federal government, anybody want to well, take that? Well, I, I would just, I, I just, I would say that we need to come around to supporting all paths, right, to, to good employment, right, in the jobs that we need, right? So that's both traditional and non-traditional, right? So any kind of support we can do to uh, apprenticeships, Right, IT apprenticeships, technical apprenticeships in organizations. You know, I know this is a U.S.-based um, conference, but in U.K., I have I have 60 people that are apprentices at a high school, and the government helps fund that as something that they do. And then while they're working, they're actually getting a degree in which I've created a good majority of the technical curriculum, right? And so, and and again, that's a different path, right? Meeting a different need. But I think we need to open our eyes up and and not stigmatize the fact that. Right, whether we need electricians or whether we need IT folks or whether we need these folks, not all those require the same path, right? And that doesn't mean that that's the end of the road, right? And so I think just opening this up that kind of work is cool and, and doing a lot of different things is, is cool and there's not one way to get there. Yeah, yeah. And Lin supporting that. Linda, the feds, you want us? You, well, I you're think not college president, you can't even discuss this, <laughs> I'm sure now. I don't want <laughs> I Sorry think to put one you of the spot. things that it, it's maybe a bit broader issue, but I think anything we can do to support sort of entrepreneurial efforts. So, I mean, most of the job growth in this country does not happen in big companies. All of it is happening in small and medium-sized mm -hmm. businesses. And so I think the more we can do to encourage that, which then gives young people coming out the ability in many ways to create their own path and to do what they're passionate about and love to do, 
And I know you're doing a lot of work in, in that entrepreneurship space, even with young children. And I think that's actually really important. So policies at the state and federal level that encourage that, that support it, that support education along those ways and make it easier for people uh, to go down that path, I think will create a lot of new job opportunities. It will create pathways to work that we probably haven't even thought about because young people are really creative about what they want to do. Yeah. Good. I Sean think, uh, you know, just building on what Ty mentioned about the infrastructure, one of the interesting examples that we've observed, we work up in, in Canada, so not, not in the center of the universe here in, in D.C., we work all over North America. And in British Columbia, um, the provincial government there has made uh, a very a significant investment in making sure the, you know, every part of, of that province is, is wired with, with adequate broadband, uh, especially obviously for classroom use. And it's an extensive uh, investment, but at the end of the day, um, that helps companies like us do our jobs more effectively. So if I can make sure a student, um, you know, in, in Vancouver is seeing our programs as well as they are up in, you know, the upper northwest part of, of, of the province, um, that helps. That helps scale. And so I, I certainly agree with, with, with Ty's point around uh, making sure that the federal government is, is pushing infrastructure policies like that. Because at the end of the day, um, our, our work in K-12 is very local. It's, mm -hmm. it's provincial. It's state-based. It's obviously district or school board based. Um, so, uh, you know, so we're kind of uh, toggling in between there, but I think those infrastructure in investments are important. Good. Ty, you're gonna, I'm gonna give you the last word here, because sure. we're, we're so very quick, The last thing that I would say from a, from a governmental support perspective, the other thing that I would mention, which is my point number two, is really around uh, transportation infrastructure. I had the misfortune of living in New York and commuting to Philadelphia to work at Comcast every day, and I had to take Amtrak to do that. And currently in Silicon Valley, we have uh, 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 diesel locomotives that move people up and down, and that's also congested. Uh, in the state of California, there's an initiative for a high-speed high rail between uh, Los Angeles to San Francisco, and uh, that's something that's currently been derailed. That's, a, that's an opportunity really both there and here in the Northeast Corridor and then uh, potentially in the Dallas-Houston Corridor to really uh, unlock value in the job market by providing high-speed rail in addition to potentially autonomous cars. And what I mean by that is that a four-bedroom house in San Francisco is about $2 million. A four-bedroom house in Fresno and Modesto is about $200,000. So it's one-tenth the cost. And with a high-speed rail in the state of California, it would allow me to hire workers in Fresno and Modesto. They could get into San Francisco in an hour and 10 minutes at a much lower cost basis than people who currently live in the city. So for the, for the constituents of people who serve the Central Valley in the state of California, it's an opportunity for them to really grow their tax base and income levels uh, 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 so that they can rise in accordance with the rest of the state. I would say the th same opportunity exists in the Houston, Houston Dallas, uh, San Antonio quarter, and same thing in the Northeast as well. All right, well, we're going to have to leave it there because we want to be mindful of time. Um, I, I want to just thank our panelists for the terrific insights that they offered us. 